The item on the agenda is citizen comment. If any citizen would like to render comment, please step forward to the podium on our left, your right, and render comment. Looking over the council chambers, I see no citizens present. Therefore, we've satisfied this element of the agenda. The next item on the agenda is approval of the March 21, 2017 Planning Commission meeting minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve? I move. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? There being none, let's take the vote. All in favor of approving the minutes, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Any abstentions, raise your hand. There being none, the minutes are approved. The next item on the agenda is neighborhood business zone review introduction. And I turn our attention to the city staff. So good evening, Planning Commission. Um, so if you want to raise your screens um, so you can kind of follow along with this. So tonight's the start of the neighborhood business zone review, the introduction, and so this will be on your agenda for the next several meetings. Um, so the, a lot of information in the packet to give you some background, um, give you some information on some of the policy issues that we'll be looking for direction on. So that's kind of where we are heading this evening. Um, I'm stalling for time here. Uh, <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're good. Hey, Bridget, could you put like, the lights above down a bit so it doesn't glare up as much? Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. So as Debbie mentioned tonight, I'm going to be introducing the Neighborhood Business Zone Project to you. As you recall, this was the next item on your docket. And the purpose of going over uh, this particular zone is because it's the last commercial zone that the city of Kenmore has not directly tackled. Um, they, the city has made adjustments in all the other commercial zoning districts and really made them uh, pertinent and relevant to Kenmore, but this one has not been addressed. Um, so I wanted just to give you some background <coughs> on the zone, and then we can begin to discuss some policy questions uh, and get your perspectives on that. And at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I'll give you uh, an outline of what we think the probable schedule could be. So tonight's goal, again, is to review background about the Neighborhood Business Zone, I'll call it the NB Zone, and begin uh, consideration of the policy issues. This is not um, a very big zone. There are just two nodes of it, and if I can make my, I guess you guys can't see the little um, arrow here, but uh, if you look down to the big blue area at the bottom of the zoning map, that's Bastyr University. Uh, if you move up one blue point, that is Arrowhead Elementary, and one of the nodes of NB, zone, NB zoning is right across the street there at Northeast um, 153rd Place. And then if you keep moving north along Juanita Drive, uh, you come up past the golf course and you see a light green square just south of the river, that's Rhododendron Park. And then just across the street there is another area of light pink zoning. That's the other node at Northeast 170th Street. So I uh, have some photos here. Uh, some of these were taken from the King County Assessor's website, and I think they're still relevant. I've been out to both of those areas. And um, so the, at Northeast 153rd place, there are five parcels of NB zoning. The picture on the left is of a vacant, I think it was probably a convenience store maybe, I'm not sure what that was, but it's been vacant for quite some time. There have been some inquiries about that property, about a new use going in, but it is across the street from the rest uh, of the other four parcels of NB zoning. Uh, if you move then onto the uh, south side of Northeast 153rd Place, uh, the building on the right with the checkerboard top is an auto repair, auto service business. 
And then uh, there is a basically a vacant parcel. There's outdoor storage on it, uh, no particular use at uh, the moment. And then next to that, there's this little butcher shop, the blue building on the left. And then on the right, I think it's called Rocky's Corner, uh, at the food store. Uh, it's a convenience mart, basically. So those are the parcels, the five parcels at Northeast 153rd. If you look at Northeast 170th Street, there are four parcels. Again, this is a very small zoning district. One is uh, uh, farther along. Uh, it's not right on Juanita. It's one parcel back on Northeast 170th Street, and that's the Fortune Inn. It's a restaurant. That's the picture on the left. On the right, there's a strip mall. Uh, this is right on the corner of Northeast 170th Street and Juanita. And then uh, as you move past that strip mall, you come across another um, similar strip mall set perpendicularly to the first one, and there's a veterinary office in that particular building. And then a little farther to the south is another auto repair business. I believe it's a transmission shop, and there may be other um, uses there as well. So the comprehensive plan says that the purpose of the neighborhood business district is to provide convenient daily retail and personal services for a limited service area and to minimize the impacts of commercial activities on nearby properties. Most of the MB zone is surrounded by multifamily residential zoning uh, and to provide for some limited residential development. So. Uh, multifamily is an allowed use, and the appropriate residential densities are identified at eight dwelling units per acre with up to 12 units per acre for density bonuses. If you have, there are different ways you can get density bonuses through providing affordable housing or providing park space, for example. The zoning code echoes this. Uh, vision from the comprehensive plan. So the purpose is to provide, again, convenient daily retail and personal services for a limited service area, minimize impacts on nearby properties, and provide for limited residential development. That's almost identical. The purposes are accomplish accomplished by limiting non-residential uses to retail or personal services, which serve everyday needs of surrounding residential areas, allow mixed use development, and townhouse development, and excluding industrial and community or regional business scaled uses. So again, a focus here uh, that is more explicit in the zoning code about limiting uh, the size of uses. So in your materials, I uh, provided a comparison of the community business and the neighborhood business zone. And I did that because community business is the one other commercial zone that really is more of a, has more of a community focus. As you recall, regional business and waterfront commercial and downtown commercial all have a much um, broader focus. Regional business, again, is supposed to be a regional draw, potentially. Downtown commercial is the focus, supposed to be the focus of the city's uh, commercial and office development. But community business is kind of its own little zone. It sits along Northeast 181st Street, just to the uh, west of downtown. So once you get beyond the main downtown area, between, um, I think it's about 60, maybe 67th, 65th or 67th, all the way to 61st is the community business zone stretching along Northeast 181st Street. It's pre predominantly residential at the moment. I think there's one mixed use project and there's a, a fairly big new townhouse project going in there. But I thought the comparison was worth it because they're sim they could be perceived as similar, again, with more of a community rather than a regional focus. So uh, I wanted just to talk through a little bit this comparison and then we can dive into uh, some of the initial policy questions. So in the neighborhood business zone, uh, allowable uses include daily retail. Again, that was something that both the comp plan and the zoning introduction talk about. Personal services and limited residential development, including townhomes, some mixed use. 
And the community business zone is very similar, mixed use, small scale retail, office and personal service uses. So the main difference here is office. Office is really called out in the community business zone, but it is not called out in the neighborhood business zone. Discouraged uses in the neighborhood business zone, again, are that industrial and community, regional, business scale, those larger uses. In the community business zone, discouraged uses are extensive outdoor storage and auto-related uses. So again, um, outdoor storage and auto-related uses are not discouraged in the NB zone, and in fact, there are several of those uses on those limited number of parcels. Uh, as for the focus of the zone, the neighborhood business zone is to serve the everyday needs of the surrounding residential area, whereas the community business zone is slightly different. It supports the larger commercial area, that's downtown. I think we're gonna be washed away here. <laughs> um, so the community business zone is really a support area for downtown. It's uh, uh, supposed to support, also support the local community with retail and services, but also supports downtown with housing. Uh, so again, the difference, neighborhood business zone is focused exclusively on the needs of surrounding residential areas. So this is kind of an interesting contrast uh, in my mind, whereas the neighborhood business zone is really supposed to be focused on the everyday needs of the surrounding residential area, and yet in terms of development, it serves, I'm sure, a much broader area um, than just the surrounding residential area. And then maximum densities, uh, neighborhood business zone is eight dwelling units per acre, up to maybe 12 with density bonuses. Community business is 24 dwelling units per acre with up to 36 with density bonuses. So it's significantly higher, and that may be because of its proximity to downtown and the fact that the community business zone is really designed to provide housing close to the downtown center. The only other uh, thing that I called out was that the community business zone particularly states that the community business area should be pedestrian friendly. And, and that is not something that's called out for neighborhood business. So with that, we can, I itemized in the memo some of the policy issues and we can begin to talk about those. I, maybe what I'll do, I wanna skip ahead here a little bit and um, look at the proposed project schedule. I think this might be helpful uh, just to think about as, as we begin the discussion. So what we anticipate is that this evening and on May the 2nd, uh, we would kind of hash through some of these policy issues and others that you may identify. Then at the second meeting in May, or maybe another evening that week, depending on schedule, we were thinking about a community outreach event. There are so few parcels involved in these zoning districts that it seems that it would be very important to have the people who own those properties in the room. <laughs> so I would anticipate some sort of direct mailing, and I've already asked Bridget to start collecting uh, both owner and um, resident mailing information for those parcels and then an area generally we go to a thousand feet beyond it so that we would do some sort of targeted outreach. I don't know what that would look like and you may have some thoughts about that. Um, but that's what we do toward the end of May. In June, after hearing uh, what those uh, folks had to say, we would continue review and make uh, preliminary recommendations. Uh, maybe the first part of July, we would hold a, the public hearing on any recommended changes. In August, finalize the recommendations, and then in August, we would do uh, the environmental review, send our notice to the state, sort of these technical requirements that we have to accomplish. And then in September, uh, you all would present your recommendations to the city council. So that um, is the schedule. I don't know if you have any questions about any of this before we jump right into policy yeah. issues. Anybody? Vice Chair? I have a question or two, please. Yeah. What would the status be of uh, current non-compliant 
businesses under this framework. Existing businesses on these NV zones, as I've read, the allowed and permitted uses and the prohibited uses. Right. So whenever, if, if zoning is ever changed uh, in an area, there are a couple of ways that it has been approached in Kenmore. Traditionally, if you have a use that you no longer think is appropriate for an area, it's deemed non-conforming. And once it's non-conforming, there are limitations on expansion and uh, redevelopment. And in, in this city, you can potentially expand a non-conforming business if you go through the conditional use permit process. So that's uh, traditional non-conformance. Now, elsewhere in the city, uh, historically, there have been times when a business was given special rights uh, beyond traditional nonconformance. So, um, for example, I think some of the auto-related businesses along SR 522 have that special designation, that even though the zoning changed, the existing uses were allowed to continue without any limitations, uh, any of the limitations of a traditional nonconformance. So, two ways to approach that issue. And if you, you know, if you don't do anything that makes them non-conforming, then they just continue as they are. Okay. Is there any non-conforming uses right now in those two areas? You know, I, um, I would have to look at the auto repair chart specifically. I'm not sure that there are any because I think auto repair is a permitted use, and that's the only one. I mean, I know retail and restaurant um, are permitted. Uh, the vacant building, the inquiries have been about a restaurant. Uh, outdoor storage isn't specifically addressed in the zone, but it's almost like a vacant, vacant property. Um, and uh, so Debbie's doing the same search that I'm gonna do for auto repair. Yeah, it's, um, it says auto repair, auto service, permitted use, but there are footnotes that go along with that. Okay. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to point out in the charts themselves, we gave you both charts. We gave you the existing use chart and we gave you a converted use chart. And I should describe a little bit about that. So when uh, some of you were on the Planning Commission when we took the 200 land uses and we wrestled around with them and re reduced them down to 50 land uses in an attempt to streamline the code and make it easier for both applicants, the general public, and staff to use. Uh, currently, uses across the zoning districts vary. Um, we fixed the three zones that were worked on with this commercial zoning project, but there are nine zones left that haven't been converted. And that project, it's called the Land Use Streamlining Project. The goal is not to make any uh, policy changes, but in fact to convert all the zones using a consistent framework of land uses. That project was introduced to the City Council last night, and we are hoping uh, that they may take action on that even in June so that all the land uses would be converted into the 50 standard land uses across all zoning districts. So the chart that you, the second chart you have in your materials is that converted land use chart. Uh, that's the one that was given to the city council last night preliminarily. And I hope regardless of where you fall out on the policy decisions that we will at least um, work in tandem with the new chart to make sure that we're only using the new land uses as you move forward with uh, your recommendations. Which attachment is that? Okay, so attachment four, sorry, attachment four is the existing chart and um, it has four categories, permitted, conditional, special use, and prohibited. And that is, um, many pages, I think that's like 11 pages, and then attachment five to your materials is the new chart uh, converting um, all of those uses in the old chart into the 50 
it's actually 52, 52 land new land uses. Um, and the other corollary to that is that in all zones, but neighborhood business and single family residential, those are holdover King County zones, the special use permit process has been eliminated. And now there are only three categories, permitted, conditionally permitted, and prohibited. So that also is something that has gone forward to council to say when you're amending these charts, let's make them all consistent, let's use the same land use terms, and there are only three categories. So you'll see in attachment four, there's that special use column. Those special uses have been converted into conditional uses. Can you remind us what the limits are on losing your legal non-conforming use status? That. So if you're, you, if you're a legal non-conforming use, i.e. grandfathered. Right. After we, let's say we've changed this to prohibit auto-related businesses in the right. neighborhood business zone, what, at what point do those grandfathered businesses lose their grandfathered status? Well, if, if you were to change the code and not say anything special and they were just to become flat legal non-conformances, they would never lose that status until the use changed. Right. And when is that line? Where is that line? Is it a one-year period after they've the, stopped the, using it? Oh, oh, right. There's no, some, the, it, some allowance for interim, so, interim non -use. So there are a couple, there are several different ways. Um, for example, if the property is damaged, uh, you have like 12 months to come in for a new permit to reestablish the use. Beyond that, there aren't any time limits. That's the one um, time limit for nonconformance. And then there are other specific expansion limits. You can expand by 10%. I think it's height. Uh, if you had a building FAR, which this, um, this zone does not, but if you did, you can expand that by 10%. There's a limited number of things that you can expand. And then if you can't meet that, again, then you go to the conditional use permit process if you want to uh, apply to expand your business. Now, the, the downfall for most nonconformances is that to uh, receive a conditional use permit, you have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. And presumably, a nonconforming use would find it difficult to, to meet that test. If somebody just stopped, instead of repairing damage, they just stopped operating for a period of time? Yeah, I think that maybe is the 12-month grace period there? Correct. Okay. And uh, at what point is something considered a different use? Let's say they went from, I guess auto-related is so broad, it'd be hard to get up, hard to split hairs on that. Um, well, uh, I mean, you, you would look to the use categories uh, for one thing. So, for example, if you had, uh, th uh, there's not a zone where this would be the case, I don't think, but if you had a retail business and you converted to a personal service business and retail business, for whatever reason, was nonconforming, you would have lost your, um, uh, that would be a change to your mm -hmm. use. Okay. So, I, I think there are probably two that I'm aware of non-conforming uses. The building across from Arrowhead that you showed, the butcher shop, mm -hmm. I think is primarily a wholesale trade business. Well, they have retail there. Yeah. Uh-huh. But so, I think that's a really, uh, a relatively small part of their overall business. So I would say it's, at best it's a mixed, it's a mixed use. Right, so the question uh, for something like that, um, it, it would be a matter of interpretation. Development services would interpret which, uh, whether it was a retail or a wholesale business, and it could be that it's a retail business with a wholesale component and accessory use, and uh, prohibited uses can be uh, accessory use if, in fact, they really are accessory. They have to be, for the most part, uh, subordinate. Um, they have to be related to the primary use. That kind of thing. So it's an interpretation question, and I, I frankly don't, I don't know enough about that business to tell you one way or the other which way 
that interpretation would go, except I do know there is retail use there. Yeah. And the second one is the, I, I just, and this one's a little interesting, right? It says automotive sales and service, mm -hmm. non-marine, and then in the footnote, automotive sales are prohibited. <laughs> Right. So you can do automotive sales and service, you just can't do sales. Right. <laughs> right. So it's interestingly worded. But there's an active automotive sales component to the area that you described as the okay. transmission. Right. And again, the, that would be an interpretation question. Is, is the sales an accessory use? Now, in some zones, there's a footnote that says, can't do. Access, you can't do um, automotive sales even as an accessory use. I can't remember what zone that is. It may be uh, the downtown commercial zone. So that can be approached in a couple of different ways. Uh, is it an accessory use? Should it not be a permitted use at all so it couldn't even be an accessory use? You could, that could be specified. Uh, it just kind of depends on which direction you would want to go with that. Whether it is or isn't an accessory business unit or, or how that's classified. The fact that they're doing it today and mm -hmm. perhaps they would have a, a non-conforming legal use to continue doing what they're doing, but a new business couldn't enter and do the same thing once Correct. this uh, regulation goes into effect. Right. If, if you decided to prohibit it. I, I, I think, you know, this is all, non-conformance is so difficult because it's always a question of interpretation. If, for example, the transmission shop didn't change anything except it changed its ownership, probably the nonconformance could continue. On the other hand, if the transmission shop were torn down and someone wanted to come in and put in a new auto sales lot, no, it would have crossed the threshold and would no longer be allowable as a nonconformance. It, the zoning prohibits auto sales alone. That's why it couldn't continue under the previous. Right, and that's probably not a good example. I, I was trying, I, that's not the distinction I was trying to make. I was trying to say that it, if you have a nonconformance, for example, the automotive service business is a nonconformance, say, under a change to rules. If the automotive service business were to stay there in the same building with this, uh, the same basic conduct of business, but the ownership were just to change, I don't think that would affect its nonconforming status. On the other hand, if you ripped out the transmission, and we'll use another automotive service, and you wanted to put in a Jiffy Lube, that's automotive service, not okay. Because oh. it, is no, it is not any longer the nonconformance, it's a brand new business. But it's still automotive service. Correct, but it's been changed, modified, enlarged, et cetera, all the things you can't do with a nonconforming use. Well, it's just a different form of automotive service. Let's say it's not enlarged. Well, it would have to be the same building, basically. Let's the, say it is. Well, uh, I'll get the municipal code and we can read what the language exactly well, I'm not says looking for a fight or I'm just no, I, kind I of mean, curious as to yeah I think it would the, be uh, where, where the line is there. yeah let's um, okay let me call it up it's no big deal and we'll take a look and read the I bring it up because the let's say the owner wants to sell at some point Say the owner leases the space, owns the business. The owner is repairing cars, and uh, let's say they're, they have a certain niche in the market, Japanese cars. Somebody comes to the table and says, I want to buy your business, but I want to modify its service a little bit. What point would the owner then be barred from selling and the buyer be barred from operating in a slightly different service business. Right. It's, um, this is a really good question because as you think about uses, nonconformance is really important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so 
have it in front of me, and I can include this in your packet next time. That'd probably be helpful for you to have the exact language. Um, okay, nonconformance modifications to a nonconforming use structure or site improvement. Um, Modifications to a nonconforming use structure site improvement may be reviewed and approved by the department, provided that the modification does not expand or intensify any existing nonconformance. So intensify is a word that we sometimes look to, like is the business getting bigger, is it, you know. Uh, and then the modification does not create a new type of nonconformance. And then we have this next section that talks about expansions. A nonconforming use structure or site improvement uh, may be expanded provided um, that the expansion shall conform to all other provisions of the title. And then you have this 10% mm -hmm. rule uh, for building square footage if you have a floor area ratio, impervious surface parking or building height. So those are the criteria where you can do this minor 10% um, uh, change. And then beyond that, but there are a few more things in here, but beyond that, then you have to move to the conditional use permit. So intensify seems to be the line where in the, the hypothetical I'm raising that might, the most clear line that you would, would determine whether it's continuing a grandfathered use or a new use. So if somebody were, repairing Japanese cars and sold to somebody who wanted to do European cars, that would still be, without intensifying it, yeah. enlarging it, they could do that. If they right. wanted to switch from general car repair to just transmission repair, they could do that. Probably. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. If they wanted to switch to truck repair and put in a bay door, to because they're built, right. their door's not tall enough, they probably couldn't do that. 10%. Unless apply. they, right, could right. meet that 10%. So I had two other questions. One is you said, and I don't remember this from rezoning the RB, but uh, you said the auto-related businesses in the RB zone have, uh, are, are like more broadly grandfathered? No, 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 no. Um, so what I was talking about was I think in the downtown commercial zone along SR522, there's a footnote um, and I'll, I, can, I can look for it, but I think there are certain auto-related businesses that were um, in place in 2003, and I think it even refers to 2003, okay. and That's it says true. these businesses in this location yeah. can continue sort of without the burden of nonconformance. We kept that. Uh, we didn't, um, the Planning Commission didn't address downtown commercial. We okay. only did regional business, uh, Another planning commission did, or the downtown task force right. did. Uh, we only did uh, regional business, waterfront commercial, and urban corridor, which is kind of at either end of this right. downtown commercial strip, but which is why you're thinking of that. But there were related businesses in those zones. In the urban ones. corridor, there were, there was. In there's fact, another one down on the uh, east end of the 5.2. Right, right. And those were not given special dispensation. Right. Those right. were just. They're within the scope of the kind right, of grandfather correct. you just described. That is correct. Okay. And then my other question is, has the council given any direction or expressed a preference or goal for this rezone? No. Okay. We haven't, we haven't brought it forward to them. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Laurie, is the ex attachment five table <laughs> intended to be exhaustive? Or would you imagine including some language that um, covers currently unimagined types of businesses? For example, a distillery or a winery or things that we maybe just aren't anticipating? Dis distilleries and wineries are covered under light manufacturing. Um, and and so that's where I'm going to tell my wife I go on Friday <laughs> and Saturday night. Um, I'm going to do light manufacturing. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I'm going uh, to light, light manufacturing facility. Could be, could be pretty late. <laughs> just to let you know. <laughs> so um, we anticipated that these um, uh, uses would be exhaustive. And each of these uses is now defined in the zoning code. And if it would be helpful, I can give you a, a list of the definitions. That probably would be helpful. Otherwise, you need to go to the municipal code and look up each one in the, in the chapter. But you're confident that it, it could cover I am as any confident foreseeable 
type of business that would want to come into the area? I am as confident as I can be at this point. And I'll tell you where my level of confidence comes from. It's because what we did was we took a, um, it's called the North American Industrial Classification Manual, which identifies all, in, and, and several of you will remember this because you've worked on it, the NAICS, right? The NAICS Manual. Um, and it identifies all types of businesses. Now, it doesn't, certainly they can't foresee the future, but generally it identifies all types of businesses. And we made cross-references to the NAICS uh, code in all of these definitions. We said it doesn't have to be the next code to give a little flexibility in case something came along that we didn't know what to do with. And then at the beginning of the zoning code, there's a section that talks about use interpretations. And if a use comes along that doesn't seem to fit in any of these categories, then there's a process that you go through and the uh, Director of Development Services assigns it to the most appropriate category, thinking about what its impacts are and, and similar kinds of uses and that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Yes, Vice Chair. Yeah, just um, maybe for a little, um, I'm, I'm just curious, I know there, this is the only spots where we have the neighborhood business um, here in Kenmore. I'm wondering if there are other Neighboring cities that have, you know, comparable types of, um, you know, neighborhood business zones and, and how they approach their zoning. Is that something that might come up in our review or yeah, you know, Lake Forest I, Park or um, Kirkland I, or? I don't think it would come up until we have a better sense of what you're looking for. Um, if you, if the commission were to have a vision for the area, I certainly could look to other jurisdictions to see if they had something comparable that kind of met the same intent, and that might be useful for us. They won't use the same land use definitions, so we can't pull it straight across. Uh, Kirkland, I know, um, is probably not a good candidate for uh, a neighborhood that they really, they are uh, very, very specific in their commercial zones. and and. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything that would fit. I haven't looked at Lake Forest Park, but as we refine what uh, the vision for the area is and kind of a, I have a better sense of how you all would see it, then I certainly could look to other places and see if there's something that might fit. Just from that perspective, I think that would yeah. be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that might be the segue to the next way to sort of brainstorm this. What kind of vision do we see for these little parcels? clusters right so if we were to go back um, <laughs> to the policy issues uh, yeah, if, I, if you don't mind because this is going to be a fascinating conversation and let me know if this isn't relevant to our conversation but what would the process be if someone wanted to add a commercial business to an existing residential neighborhood so take North Kenmore for example um, out towards Meridian, 85th Street type area, if somebody wanted to add a convenience store or a candy shop or something to that neighborhood, which may be not zoned for that currently, is neighborhood business zone then an option we may have to, to zone an area appropriately so somebody could do that? So if, if a zone is created and somebody thinks that there's an appropriate place in the city for it, they have to go through two steps. The first step would be a comprehensive plan amendment because our, our overall comprehensive plan map and our zoning map are supposed to be pretty much identical. And in the north part of the city, there wouldn't be an area targeted for commercial. It's, it, it's pretty much exclusively residential. But a person could apply in the application period every year and they could say, I have this great idea uh, for a comprehensive plan amendment for this location, and then they would propose the amendment and uh, the associated zoning, and then that would go forward and the city council would decide whether they think it's worth looking at. And, and if they did, then the comp plan amendment and the zoning would go together through, a pro they'd be assigned to the docket, basically. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry to derail the. No, that, that's a good question but because the the idea of having a small um, sort of a neighborhood business model or zone that could be applicable in different places has has come up. Right. Uh, at least at the staff level sometimes. Yeah. Just for that very reason, a neighborhood store or right. something like that. So of these two policy issues on the overhead, mm -hmm. I think you've already answered number one. Uh, the actual development deviates somewhat from the description, right? The zoning description. Well, th there are aspects of it that I think deviate. I think uh, that uh, I don't view auto, auto sales and services is a, is a hard one because certainly it serves people in the immediate vicinity. I mean, I'm sure I would guess that people who live around there may use those services. So it does sort of serve the local area, but it's not a traditional local service. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it doesn't fit the description of retail and personal service. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm interested in your perspective about whether you think that auto sales and service actually is something that is appropriate in a neighborhood to serve surrounding residents. Oh, Mike. This may be indirectly related. What is the relevance of uh, the MD zoning today? I mean, I could understand back in the day when we were uh, part of unincorporated communities, county, and you had a very low density, and so having a Rockies corner nearby was, was, was a convenience in life. But today, Juanita Drive is a major thoroughfare there. Uh, anchored at both ends by major retail service uh, opportunities. And we're trying as a community to build up a downtown Kenmore as really the site for which these services would be provided. So when I think about that, I'm not really sure what a neighborhood business would look like today on one need to drive. Uh, the other question that came to my mind is the two locations really feel very different to me. The one on 170th is actually, I think, at a fairly busy crossroads. Uh, and it has the capacity to handle the traffic. It's our challenge to handle the traffic ahead today. But I think it's in a much better place than I think the location uh, at 153rd, especially given that it's across the street from an elementary school. Uh, you have the, the new uh, cross street there that you can take, you can, that street has been, it goes from I need to drive and you can take it up to Woodenville or further out uh, in the bottle, was specifically uh, designed to impede, or not impede, but let's say to slow down and smooth out traffic. You've got all those curves in there, and it's largely residential. So it's not really a thoroughfare in the same way that 170th is in the corner of 170th and Juanita Drive. And the surrounding area is much more residential uh, than I think you have at the other locations. So when I think about those two, they feel very different to me. When you think about what would be appropriate to be in those spots down the line, I think it just feels to me like you'd be going in a very different direction. So I don't have any conclusions necessarily out of that, other than to say, I really question, there are things that I like about the MD zone, there are things that I like and don't like about the CB zone. I think in between there, there's probably a definition that would work at least for the 170th and probably for the 153rd, but I'm not sure the current definitions uh, are really consistent with the reality we have today. So I'll, I'll stop there just to see what other people think, but that's, that's what's been going through my mind as I think this through. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'd like Scott. to add on that, what Mike said. Uh, I've got a different kind of viewpoint. I think that... Uh, if you've got a business like an auto repair place, uh, and he probably has uh, sells a few cars because he picks them up, and you know they 
dump them on his doorstep and say, can you fix it? And they said, no, well, I don't want it. And he picks it up and sells it. I, I think that's healthy. I think, you know, you know, America was built on, you know, the mechanic in the local uh, auto shop and, you know, having something like that really close by is, is healthy and something that they want. You know, the, a lot of people can't, you know, the tow, tow charge to come down to Kenmore from up there might be 150 bucks and yet they could probably get their car there much cheaply, much more cheaply uh, if it was closer. So I, I just think, because I've been in that shop and it's, it's, it's uh, really kind of a community, uh, there's a community feel to it. So I, I think that's a healthy thing. The, the one thing that kind of uh, you look at is that empty uh, restaurant, a former restaurant or, or uh, uh, used to be a karate I think it, place. Right. Too. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, and it's the problem with that area is that when you get in there, it's a steep uh, drive into that place, and, and it's kind of just not a very uh, amenable uh, place to get into. And, and I, it'd be, you know, maybe think of some things like uh, having residential on top of a commercial space, potentially. I don't know, but that's. But I, I and in that little, uh, the uh, butcher shop. You know, a lot of the businesses now they uh, they they have to be online uh, to survive because they're you know going up against Amazon.com or whatever. And and so he's got his butcher shop, and then he's got to have this other business. I don't know which one is his main business or both of them, but I know a guy who started a, a tea shop in. Kirkland, and I says, God, how are you making it on this? You tell them, selling cups of tea to people. He says, oh, I've got an online store, and we do that out of here, too. So I, I think that uh, we've got to allow for the, the new paradigm with uh, uh, retail business and, and online business and, and wholesaling stuff. So I think it's I think it's pretty cool actually, and and uh, uh, the only thing we want to would want to you know have a healthy business environment there, and and I think everybody, a lot of people go to the butcher shop there, a lot of people get their cars uh, fixed there. I, my kid's car has been fixed there very many times, and and uh, and the guys are, I forget his name, he's a, he's a great guy, uh, and then and then you got the the. 7-Eleven or Rocky's Corner, it, it, you know, you got to six in the morning, you don't have any milk, and you go up there and you get your milk, you know, I mean, it's, it, and it's a busy place, so I think they're all, it, it's all helping the local area, from my perspective, and and the idea is, you know, the only thing you look to the, the one that's not being used right now, and that seems kind of unhealthy, but it's, I don't know if it's just the way the geography of that that store or that, that that land is that makes it so tough and so if we could do something to enhance the viability of that spot somehow and uh, that's my viewpoint on it I, I, I you know thanks Scott yeah 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 Mike well, there's somebody else that uh, I, I don't disagree with you Scott I really don't have a hardened opinion here what I keep coming part of what I keep back to some of the earlier discussions we had when we were looking at regional business and some of the others. You know, we've got viable businesses there today. We don't want to disrupt them. We want them to allow them to be able to continue. But at the same time, if we, if we start thinking 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, that's pretty valuable property out there. And I think when we look at, thinking about 153rd, again, se separately from 170th, which I think is a different scenario, you look at what's there, it's pretty much underdeveloped. I mean, what's there, the properties that are there, the buildings that are there, uh, they're low rent, which is, I think, what's attractive to the businesses that are there today. Down the line in time, I'm not sure that that's going to continue to be true. So what I come in my mind then is what is likely to be there? What, what does the community want to have there 20 years down the line? Uh, it, it may be mixed use, similar to what we've done in, in, in some other areas have a combination of, of retail and, uh, and residential. But I don't think it's going to be uh, 
very much like what it is today. So the question is, what, it, what does that look like, and what's compatible with the things that are likely not to change, like having a, uh, an elementary school across the street, having mostly single-family residential, although on one side you actually have uh, there are townhouses that are there, you have multifamily. Condos. So how do you become more consistent with what's likely to be there and where the economy is likely to push the development of that property into the future? And I just don't see the way it's used today being the way that the, the economics are going to kind of drive it down the line. But my thought, my thinking is the uses are going to be determined by the market. Right now, the demand is soft or something. Either. There's one of two issues here as to why it's underdeveloped, because I tend to agree it is. Either the zoning doesn't permit the most desired use, or the market isn't there to create the, the more sophisticated use. And we'd have to go back to our zoning chart and say, see, OK, is there something that's a likely development that's not permitted? The most obvious, which we learned from the whole RB rezone, was multifamily housing. Is that not permitted in that zone? Oh, I thought, I, yeah, small. What was that, Doc? What was multifamily your? housing. Limited. Condos or townhomes. Was that 8 to 12? Yeah, so it was yeah. 8 per, eight, eight per acre. Low density. low density, right, like townhomes maybe. So yeah. the condos immediately to the south of Rocky's Corner, is that where those condos are? Yeah. Yes. What's the zoning on that? I think it's R24, the zoning map. I was looking at that, actually. Um, While you're looking for that, I, 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 there may be another 18. reason why it's not okay. developed. And the owner could be holding out yeah. for a bigger dollar. That's true. And uh, because that, that, that area that where the gas station used to be, you, you know, I, I'm sure that he's, I would expect that Whoever owns it expects to sometime develop it or sell it for a higher, better use. And so let's back up where the gas station used to be. Yeah. Is that where the butcher shop is or the, the auto the place is? No, no. The, the, the vacant? The butcher shop was the old store. Okay. okay. It was a little, that was the first store. Yeah. Then the store went where the auto place is now. Okay. It, that was 7 Eleven where the auto place is. Oh. And then, and then, and then, when they went to Rockies, where it is now, uh, then it became an auto store, uh, an auto repair place. But that was a gas station or prior. It was, yeah, it was a uh, 76 or Union 76. Uh, on, uh, on did it cover that? On the corner. Yeah. On the corner. Do, what, did any part of that gas station cover the vacant yes. parcel? No, yeah, that's where it was. That's where that's the pumps where were. It was. So you might be sitting on an EPA cleanup site. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it may be contaminated, which yeah. is why it's not built out. That's, that could be very well be true. Those corner gas stations are notorious for that. I'm wondering about that. <laughs> no. yeah, no. <laughs> and if you want to go back further where that empty Actually, uh, might, restaurant is, that. it, you, that's where the paper, uh, Seattle Times papers were. Uh, they had a, the, the paper shack there. You got to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or collaborate with the <laughs> historical society. Here. And, and that's for when I was in the elementary school, the first that's time I saw everybody, the kids smoking cigarettes behind <laughs> the <show. laughs> Is there still a smoking sign? <laughs> that's your limitation. Kids so. back there <laughs> with the Heart hoodies. Yeah. And they kind of furtively suck. I'm wondering smoke. about the uh, karate studio that was the last yeah. occupant there. W would that be a permitted use? Of a residential, of a neighborhood business zone, or would that be a prohibited use? Yeah, he looks like I guess that would be conditional as a recreational facility. Would that be? Hold on. Yeah, so it could be a recreational facility indoor if it was a, a, um, a recreational, you know, a place where you went to do karate and that kind of thing. If it was more of a school, Mm -hmm. There's a potential that it could be an educational service. Mm. Um, so it kind of would depend on what exactly was going on. I mean, if it was a large gym with lots of people running yeah. around and practicing, then yeah. maybe uh, conditional use. But I a small 
you know, if it was a 10 person class yeah. three times a week, maybe it's educational. To answer your earlier question, I, I like the idea of the neighborhood business zones and the vision around that. Primarily being focused on meeting the daily needs of the community. So a food market like Rockies, for example, or the Manhattan Express grocery is another good example of that. I don't think either one of those two places quite lives up to their potential, but I think if you need lottery tickets or cigarettes, they're great places to go, I suppose. But you're right, they have milk, they have bread, they have some basic necessities as well, and if you're getting, arrowhead, getting out of Arrowhead at three in the afternoon and want some candy, it's, mm -hmm. it's a good place to go. So I, I think that's probably, but that would be the way I would like to see it, is, is kind of focusing on those daily needs. And I don't know where, a karate studio, or I, I think automotive shops are, are great neighborhood assets as well because you don't have to arrange for somebody to follow you to the service station. You can, if you can get your car there, you can walk home, right? And, and you can walk back to get your car when it's done. I think that's kind of nice having a neighborhood shop. So I just wanted to maybe throw a couple more things in. I, think I agree with most of everything that's been said. Um, a couple things that are maybe going to change, uh, you know, that area a little bit. One is the, you know, the walkways and waterways. We're going to have sidewalks and bike lanes. Um, that could bring additional, you know, people that, that it really isn't as accessible uh, for others as it as it is now. On the other is the, you know, the lodge of St. Edward's Park, which isn't too far from the, what is it, the 153rd. Um, has potential to bring in a, you know, a lot of people uh, to to that area that's very close by. So I definitely agree with the vision of it serving, you know, primarily the you know the local daily needs. But I think we can maybe expand that a little bit um, with with you know those two things in particular. But but I think um, yeah, if it is under, I think th there could be some additional opportunities that we should at least maybe look at uh, in terms of how we think about you know those two areas in particular. So. Yeah, along those lines, I, I don't think we should, you know, I, I think we would rather expand it rather than, than constrict it and let the free market uh, dictate it. But at the same time that, you know, if you wanted to put in a residential uh, part to it, then you, you wouldn't allow, allow that on the ground floor. It would be up on top, which a, a lot of uh, development these days is uh, going that way. Right, and you know this brings to mind a lot of the things we talked about before you were on the commission, Scott. You're getting to those those very good points. When we rezoned the and proposed rezone to the council on the regional business corridor here, 522, um, we talked to a consultant. What was the name of it, Mark? Burke. Burke. Yeah. Because we wanted at the front end to, to find out what is the demand for this kind of an area. What does Kenmore need to do to attract? more investment, the kind that we want, which are higher wage businesses and um, office space and make it more of a commercial center. We've got a very small economy here relative to the surrounding cities. What can we do to compete with their, their economies? Um, and they told us, well, there's some things that there's their perceptions of Kenmore, and there's some things you can do if you were to allow multifamily housing, it would probably take off. That's the highest profit point in the market. On the other hand, do you want to give up some of your business space, which you couldn't reclaim later once it's rebuilt out that way? So that's a consideration. But with respect to mixed use, the kind with business on the bottom and residential on the top, those are popular, but not in less valuable commercial in less valuable areas. So if you go to Capitol Hill, you'll see a lot of it. It's worth it. You'll get businesses to fill that bottom floor. But if you move out into less desirable areas, Lake City Way is a good example of this. You know that really big apartment complex that was built five years ago or so? Can't remember the name of it. It's near 140th and Lake City Way. It's like six stories. Mm -hmm. Reiki? No, it's north of that, Yeah, okay. closer to us. Okay. It starts with an A, I think. They have leased out, my understanding is that they've leased out those apartments, or they probably did it right away. They still haven't leased out the commercial space on the first floor. But 
some developers are doing those projects because it's still lucrative enough to lease out the apartments that they can take the loss on not leasing out the commercial space. Burke was telling us you're probably not going to get businesses to lease out those commercial spaces. And that was on 522. So that's probably at least as true for these neighborhood business parcels. Um, on the other hand, that would be uh, an, an expanded use from what we have now. We only have eight parcels per acre, and you increase the density. And still, I think the big question for us is going to come down to do we allow mixed use or just high des density residential, higher density residential? Because something would probably be developed faster if it were higher density residential without the office component or the business component. On the other hand, the things that everybody's saying is it'd be nice to have personal services or local retail, neighborhood businesses like the auto store or like a small grocery store to service the, the growing number of families. The, there's some degree of, I think, build out still going on in those neighborhoods around there. Um, and that would be an argument for mixed use. Even though it wouldn't fill up, wouldn't be developed as fast in the long run, maybe that's the best proposition for that area economically and, con and for convenience. So that's where I'm kind of thinking that's going to be the, the real, the key issue in this. But that's just my view. Doug, how much additional density can that area support? <clears throat> we need to drive specifically Arrowhead. What do you mean, how much could it support? You mean the roads? <laughs> the roads, the schools, the services. Well, that's about services. concurrency and mitigation. You can, you can require the, the developers to contribute as part of their permitting fees a big chunk of money to offset the increased burden it would have on the infrastructure. So how much would it support? Well, they would have to pay for that support. So it could support a lot more, I think, unless staff wants to correct me on that. We, uh, we have uh, general projections. I, I don't have them in front of me uh, for that part of the city. It's broken out into, uh, it was done for the traffic modeling in 2014, 2015. So we have some sort of general sense of how much growth there could be if you want me to track that down. I'm just curious if we talk about increasing the use because we're at R8 conversations at R8 now, right, with R12 right. with uh, bonuses. Right. Um, beyond that, I think we need to look at things like the traffic pattern between Arrowhead and Inglemore and the traffic control devices they're putting in those neighborhoods specifically to try to calm it, mitigate or calm what's already happening. And, and so how would, that, how would that play out? Somebody, let's say we zoned it commercial or increased the density or mixed use we made it r24 mm -hmm. and somebody said okay i'm going to build out mixed use with condos or apartments in the, one of those parcels and they put in the 24 let's say maybe it'll take two parcels to do that but or they put in 12 and a half acre but they would have to pay a chunk of money for the burden on the infrastructure do that would take, isn't there a big lag effect before that money gets used to actually improve the infrastructure to support those additional 24 units? Right. There, so there are two different things. One is the traffic impact fees uh, that go towards specified projects on the transportation list. And then the other component is what's called safe site access. So, for example, if there were such a large development that you couldn't safely maneuver out onto the road. You might have to look at other alternatives, signaling, right turn only. I, I don't know what those might be. And this is all speculative. I'm certainly not saying that if we increase residential densities, these things would be necessary. There'd be an analysis done uh, based on the proposal to see what the impacts would be. But my sense is that there's a lag effect. Like for impact fees, there are. But if there are safe site improvements, those go in with the development. Right. And that facility immediately to the south of Rockies must be at least R24, the condos. The condos? Eight. Well, I would say. 18. There's an, is it it's orange? Eight. It's um, R18. Right. Just so south of Rockies Corner. Okay. Right. So we'd have to look at 
the actual density. The zoning is R18. I don't know what the actual density is. And was that the is. zoning at the time they had, had they had to get a variance for that, or was that the zoning at the time they built that unit? The, the Arrowhead, the Arrow, Arrow something condominiums, right? That was in place. Oh. Go ahead. I'm just wondering about, um, you know, speaking about multi-family development there, um, what's the uh, tran I know there's a bus that goes along wanting to drive, right? Is there much of a transit availability along Juanita? I know there's at least one bus that goes, I've taken it, but um, I'm not aware it's a frequent service. I'm just trying to, in terms of thinking about multi-family, and I, obviously we, we have a preference for citing it near transit, or certainly we have, right. you know, in the... I, I don't know, here. but um, that's a piece of information I can get. It's in the comprehensive plan that uh, at least generally showed the bus routes. I know there were adjustments that occurred right about the time the comprehensive plan was adopted. They were cutting back service. I can speak to um, that a little bit oh, as good. a bus route there you go. occasional user. So the buses actually don't follow Juanita Drive. There's one small service bus that does, meaning I don't like to use this term, but the short bus. Yeah, the 234? Uh, no, the 234 is full size, and the 244 are, are the two full size that leave from Kenmore Park and ride. So the 234 goes to Bellevue Transit Center, and what they do is they go up when need to drive, and they turn left at 153rd. Right by the right through there. And then they go back through Finn Hill mm -hmm. at 81st, I believe, further, further down by Moreland's. Yeah. And then the 244 follows a similar route, but it goes to Overlake Transit Center in Redmond. Hmm. Um, and they are half hourly in the morning and in the afternoon. Commute time. Yeah. I know that Metro are looking at trying to do some pilot programs for looking at more innovative ways for service, whether it's through van pools or um, other things like that to sort of supplement uh, fixed bus routes so even though it may not be served by sort of a traditional um, you know line um, you know there may be other opportunities that could serve commuters that we should probably think about as well right. okay. yeah I guess the, you know with the bike lane and the, and the sidewalk eventually I, I guess that abets transit to an extent um, so just something to kind of throw in the mix there but in terms of that particular neighborhood business district, the one on 153rd, it is, it has a bus stop at that automotive repair shop that we've been talking about. Mm. Oh, right. right there. I agree with Commissioner Vanderline that the 170th neighborhood business area is rather different. And I'd be tempted to propose something more expansive, uh, you know, more of a CB designation for that area. That's a really busy corridor, and that's a dense area, and you've got apartments on one side, and um, transit on, I don't know if you have transit on 170th, but you, you know, have the transit we've just discussed on Juanita, and it's also walking distance to the 522 transit. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to be well uh, leased out. Uh, yeah. As far as I can see. And, yeah. And that, uh, but if we were to expand, I mean, right now it's R8, and if we were to say mixed use R18 you know, or R24, we might, that would give the owners and investors incentive to do something. Well, I wouldn't Perhaps. think we'd want any residential there. That, that would, I think, would be... Well, I was thinking mixed use. So you'd have both business and residential. Yeah, I, I'm just, uh, I, you know, I, for my money on that spot, I, I think it should remain Business. Just business. Yeah. I mean, you can make an argument up on 153rd because it's underutilized, but I, I don't think that the 170th is underutilized. And it's a pretty uh, active, uh, you know, they got the vet place yeah. there and the, and the Chinese restaurant. And they're all pretty busy as far as I can see. Well, I'm not saying that we would do it so that the business, because we wanted to stimulate more business necessarily. I was thinking we'd be a good spot for more residential. The businesses would get the benefit of having you know, more consumers right there living above them. 
people would get the benefit of obviously more supply in the housing market. It's a pretty attractive location and it conforms to the TOD principles that we've advocated because it's so close to transit. I mean, I think it, my sense is that it would serve the needs that you're describing only, if anything, can give more market demand for those businesses and satisfy other goals that we've talked about in terms of transit, housing, that kind of thing. You know, what are suitable spots for density? Yeah, and then you got parking issues too. Oh yeah, I mean, they would have to be addressed. They would have to have sufficient parking. So, so I might just uh, throw in, uh, we, we touched on this, but under the current rules, multifamily is permitted as part of mixed use, right. although there is an allowance for standalone townhome, townhome development. So I'll throw that out. Just That within a mixed use, you could just have standalone townhome? It, it wouldn't have to be mixed use. It would be... Oh, that, do the it. current zoning? Mm -hmm. The neighborhood business zoning mm -hmm. allows standalone townhome. Right. Yeah, it makes us curious that that old restaurant has a, got a townhome on it. Like just to the, the Chinese one? No, no, on, on 153rd. Oh, you've got that. Yeah. You got those uh, with the sharp peak. You know, what, do yeah. you think they put a? If they could put a townhome there, that they might do that with that. Or almost anything. <laughs> Every parcel has its Notice. unique features. Yeah. And maybe, as you said, the owner is not inclined to sell it for that purpose. Yeah, I, I think it. that the one not to the north there, I, you know, it's just a really funky yeah. uh, piece of piece land, property. the way the topography. Yeah, but yeah. The, the other one that's vacant where the gas station yeah. was, that seems to be fine. Well, and that's why contamination seems to be a potential reason why it's undeveloped. Is do you think, guys, that there's value in finding out if there's a record of I, contamination? I could try and see if if we have I don't know if it changes our policy making, though. I, that's what I was wondering. You know, does it? If we were talking about a really large number of parts, but we're talking about two, so I think yeah. if there's a, and that's a, the biggest piece of that parcel, right? So I it would that be really. Zone. Yeah, It'd be good to know. It would be good to okay. know. Yeah. Okay. I'll see what I can find out. I'd also, Laurie, while you're doing a little research, like to know the current status of that vacant on the north corner of 153rd. Um, I've heard that... The, the old karate, the old karate school? studio. Yeah, I'd heard that it was under development as a yeah. restaurant. Yeah. But I haven't seen any activity in there. Right. Uh, I think there may have been some very preliminary meetings about that, about they haven't a restaurant. For permits? But I, I don't think there have been any permits applied for. I'll double check on that. I heard the same rumor. That they had, had received permits? No, 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 that, that somebody was going to put a restaurant in there. Yeah, yeah. but I'd re heard that they not only were going to do that, but that they had, are pretty far down the road towards starting the project which would imply they have their permits. I'll check on the Thanks. status. Anything else? Yes, this may be a little bit of a tangent, but um, the fact that it's so close to a school, I know there are prohibited uses, you know, within certain dimensions of a school, right? Are all the prohibited uses that, I mean, would be covered, or are they already is that something we need to think about in terms of, I mean, obviously, I presume, you know, the things we're talking about are, are fine within a school. Are, are there any other, you know, restrictions on, on allowable uses, you know, in, in what looks to be within, you know, a few hundred feet of a school? Well, facility? certainly, I mean, discussing what uses should be prohibited is, yeah. you know, that's part of your charge. Um, I'm, I'm thinking ahead to how... Uh, how best to uh, take the next steps, whether we uh, want to uh, go down sort of uh, the permitted uses, the conditionally permitted uses, the prohibited uses list, and begin to refine. I, I mean, I think this discussion has been great um, in terms of helping you all think about 
the pros and cons for different um, approaches. But at, at maybe the next step is actually to look at the uses specifically and make mm. some decisions. I, I don't know if you want to take a different approach. This would be at the next meeting we could do that. When you say look at the specific uses, right? Correct. So are you we have about it. The questions we raised about what's being, what's contaminated, or what? No, I, I am ready to provide that information to you. I'm thinking in terms of the policy discussions, what the next steps might be. I'm, I'm getting a sense that you're getting kind of a framework. There are a couple of points where you differ on certain approaches, but at some point we have to turn our attention to the actual chart and yep. begin to go sort of use by use and get reaction, feedback, that that would be useful for the prohibited uses. That might be the easiest. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about next steps. And um, I think we you, you all have kind of uh, touched on most of these questions except and you even got to this a little bit, whether the neighborhood business and community business, uh, whether there's room to use parts of the community business zone, maybe at Northeast 170th, or uh, where maybe the pedestrian friendly focus, if we're thinking of uh, relationship to transit, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, that so that's a fun. very, I'm glad you just mentioned that because, and I think it's because of the, the location of the apartment units that are just, I don't know which direction, south, south yeah. of that, um, of the veterinary clinic. Right. Which I don't know if it's fair to call that low income housing or, or. No, I think it's market, market rate of Market rate, is it? Yeah. But I do notice just in my daily commute. Yeah. That they, the, the people that live there tend to um, walk to the transit yeah. center a lot. 522. I mean, yeah. Sure. A lot of people make that yeah. walk. Yeah, I would. And they walk from Safeway back to their homes. I know yeah. there's a lot of shopping bags. So yeah. they're in a pedestrian mindset along that yeah. pathway, but I don't, currently the 68th Street Bridge doesn't do them any favors, <laughs> right? I mean, people with lots of shopping bags and yeah. coming back from work. Um, but I think there already is a pedestrian mindset yeah. to some of those close in um, apartment units there. Yeah, my, uh, just, I, I agree with what you said. I see the same observation there. And when I, it really helps me to think about these two parcels differently. And when I think about the parcel on 170th, and you look at it, it's really, you've got the park across the street, but it really is surrounded by high density housing. It's all hard to afford. But when I look at how its proximity is downtown, I mean, I, I, I would envision five or ten years, downtown is going to incorporate and spread to that area. It, 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 that's the way it's going to be. So when I think about what is the vision for that little enclave that's there in the neighborhood business today, it, it's going to go, it's going to want to be more dense. And whether that's multifamily or how that works out, it, it's probably going to have a residential component to it. But it's obviously also a really good spot for, for some sort of commercial business. And I don't know if that's retail, office, what that is, but the opportunity to have that there I think would be important. But I don't see it being focused on necessarily on the, it's not, it's not a neighborhood anymore. It's, it's at that point I think it's part of downtown. Yeah. That's up to yeah. And so I think thinking about it that same way, I keep going back to what the learning we had out of Burke in our earlier discussions about you know, how do you build amenities downtown core, density. If you build density, what do you need to have? Infrastructure. So consolidating this, and that's what we did with all of our earlier ones. We created hot, we created an area where we have a, uh, we have capacity for both retail and for multifamily to build that density. So I think about the 170, if that's going to become part of that naturally anyway. So I think thinking about what we want to do here, that's Way of thinking about that. Yeah, I agree. 100 years from now, 153rd may also be. Yeah. Good, but that's, I don't see within the time, the time frame that being. So I think the idea of looking at some of the 
better parts of the CB zone, particularly the pedestrian friendly pieces. Given the, what's going on there already, so you've got sidewalks, you've got the bridges, you've got everything else. That's going to happen. Yeah. So I think Bell, uh, blending the pieces of the two zones to cover this zone make a lot of sense. I don't know if you want to go in part. In my mind, it was beginning to go through, well, why don't we just make it a regional business if that's what it's going to be anyway, but I don't know if you want to go all the way to that already. But. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued by this idea that maybe because of the location at Northeast 170, it, it's almost the same description. Uh, I'm hearing, do you remember that CB vision that it was, it was supporting the local community, but it was also uh, providing additional density and that kind of thing for the downtown. And if you think that, well, maybe Lake Point and downtown are, are the center of the city, Northeast 170th isn't that far away, and maybe it would serve kind of the same function so that there really is a relationship between that piece of NB and the CB zone. Right? That's, I think, really interesting. So bear with me, it's already zoned for mixed use? Uh, the uh, neighborhood business zone? Yeah. Uh, multifamily is allowed through mixed use. But it just doesn't it's have not much a requirement. That's why it probably it's not attractive, at least right now. Right. You know, I think uh, we talked about what would attract, what can have more, what assets does it have to attract investments into its regional business zone? And we came away thinking our biggest assets are Lake Washington and the parks and Burt Gilman Trail, and those are our amenities. And we should try and leverage those to attract new business and higher density down here. And I think that it can be said for 170th because it's got rhododendron right there. It's, you know, you could take a bike easily to, to Burt Gilman your walking distance to the lake. So increasing density and encouraging mixed use, because I, I see that I don't want to get rid of, I don't want to just allow multifamily alone, because I think those businesses are having a chance to have businesses there. It's pretty important to serve those, that higher density that we're talking about. And I think the same may be true of uh, 153rd. It's so close to, uh, it's not quite as attractive as for all the reasons we've said, but it's still close to St. Ed's. And so that's a big amenity yep. to having a condo in that area. Well, then, how do you d d deal with the? Does it, they have less density of R8 because of the parking component of it? And I mean, it, how do you balance that? I mean, how do you accommodate parking with more density? Yeah, and what and, and for customers to be able to visit right. the business. I, I can't answer that without a specific proposal. I mean, the city has parking standards. If you're within a certain distance of transit, sometimes you can modify the amount of parking that you're required to provide. You can do joint use parking between parcels if that worked out. Um, you're, so you're advocating more parking or a higher parking ratio yeah, because you're, you've right. got businesses that people need to get in and out of, and, and the people who live there would want to just park their car for the well, three days. So that the parking standards would um, address both pieces of a mixed-use project. Um, the one other thing about a mixed-use development is that it's possible that the parking can be shared because residents are often not home during the day when the businesses are operating, depending on the type of business. It's, it's a really site-specific, use-specific kind of an analysis. But I don't, uh, you wouldn't necessarily, if you were gonna increase the density, you wouldn't look at changing the parking standards. You would, of course, have to look at the impact of that on traffic in general. So that's something um, that you would want to think about. If you went from R8 to R24, for example, there would potentially be an impact on Juanita Drive. And, and we wouldn't be doing a site-specific analysis, but at least generally we should think about mm -hmm. that. Well, because my question is about the site, the site, not the impact on the roads, just right. the site. Right, right. 
and again, the city has parking standards. They can be modified if necessary. There are options. And so I don't think you would want to make a decision about a use based on the parking standards. That, to me, um, doesn't well, I just follow. I don't like, want to be like the city of Seattle where they're eliminating parking spots and you can't. Well, it, it, the change of use would not change the parking standards. I guess that's what I'm saying, is the city ha already has fixed parking standards. We're not intending to modify the parking standards with this project. If it was a mixed-use project, you would look at how many parking stalls were required, and then you would work with the, uh, the developer to determine how that parking was going to be accommodated or whether there were other um, solutions or alternatives. What's the parking standard? What's the ratio? It, it depends on, for example, on the size of the unit. Um, what is it for the neighboring condos, the R18 the, the R condos? It's, it's not done by zoning no. district. It's done but by they, use. But they've got a so, ratio. So they would have a ratio. For example, a, one, a studio apartment has a different ratio than a three-bedroom apartment. Well, I've just Maybe that's something to find out. Is We've already got condos right next to Rocky's Corner. Mm -hmm. They've got a ratio. They've got a garage at the base of that structure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, it's underground. I know it, there's some exposure. I don't know how many levels it is is what I'm getting at. But I'd be curious okay. to know how many units and how many, what's the ratio and is that sufficient? Uh, again, I, I don't think it's necessarily relevant to the discussion okay. because the parking uh, the parking, the decisions about how many parking stalls are required go with the project. And you okay. can't build a project if you don't have adequate parking. I thought we had some, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I thought, for example, with micro units and some of the other discussions we've had about density in the downtown core, we've talked about the ratios and what should be with required, a minimum parking ratio to be required. Right. Make allowances per for type TFD of, and things like that. Per type of unit, correct. Yeah. We have talked about that, but that's a different discussion than a use yeah. discussion. Unless you were going to say in uh, at Northeast 170th, you can only build studio apartments, but we don't have any roads like that anywhere in the city right. to control the parking. I wonder if it's worth, I mean, you make, you make it sound like it's out of place to propose a parking ratio, a different parking ratio. By zone, yeah. Or a contemplated use. Yeah. I, I think okay. that w uh, looking at parking ratios and what the re parking requirements are is a huge project that would affect pretty much every zone in the city. Now, again, we did it with TOD. Yeah. Uh, and we... With microhousing. With microhousing because we had to allow... We didn't think the studio parking ratio was appropriate within us certain distance of SR522. So if you were talking about um, like multifamily at Northeast 170th should get a parking break, I suppose you could bring that in as part of the, the zoning discussion, but I don't think you'd want to go into the parking chapter and start adjusting, no. you know, at Northeast 170th, the studio apartment only I was has to thinking provide was, this. And I think this goes to Scott's, part of Scott's con concern was 153rd is a, a rather different area than 170th. Yeah. You've already got, you, you know, he's concerned about accommodating the business parking, the residential parking, if they have a higher density allowance. You've got a school right across the street. Maybe it justifies a higher parking ratio. So you don't have cars parked and issues with people uh, off parking on the street, side or near sidewalks, or illegally, or um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Again, that would be decided okay. at the time of the development. Okay. Not overall that certain uses right. in this zone require more parking. I, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I think that's, I mean, that's really where you have the discussion of parking. I mean, if somebody comes and says, I want to do mixed use, and they have, you know, so many square feet of retail and so many units, they look at the charts for how many parking spaces they have to provide, and, and they then look at the site and say, can they fit the parking, can they fit the maximum amount of retail space and residential space and park them? And so it's kind of that 
the, yeah, you know, because ongoing kind of chart, discussion. My thought was well, maybe we can have a different chart for this area, for the units in the retail space so that there might be less of a parking crunch. I will, I will say this, when people talk about zoning and multifamily, you hear a lot of complaints about parking. You know, a lot of people are complaining about, what is it called, 64? Spencer 68. Spencer 68, and a lot of the complaints are, oh gosh, you know, look at all these people with all this density and all these cars, and they park all over the place, and we've already got Murphy's Auction House with lots of parking on the Saturdays where they hold the auctions, and it's really difficult for those of us who live nearby. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I mean. I think parking is a huge issue. Yeah. And I don't mean to minimize it. I, no, I, I guess I'm just are. saying I'm just... that going into the parking charts yeah. as part of this project would be a okay. major undertaking. Major undertaking. Anything else, guys? So what's the next step? So I think um, that maybe what we could do is uh, make a decision tonight about how we want to, whether we want to think about separating the two uh, areas of NB. And we would maybe focus kind of on the CB chart for the North NB, and we focus on the NB or some modification of the NB for the South part. And then we would go into the charts and start thinking about specific uses. Um, and I can take a stab at it based on what I've heard, but I really feel like kind of this is your discussion and, and your vision. Um, so we can either take existing charts and work off of that, or I can take a stab at it, having heard what I heard. <laughs> existing charts mean look at MB and CB, yeah. right. and the stab is the hybrid or something. Uh, a hybrid. Maybe a uh, change chart. NB, manipulate NB a little bit more, and manipulate CB some, reflecting that the, it may be more similar to the existing CB zone. Are we good with this? Yeah, seems a good way to go. Okay. okay. And so next time we'll dive into the charts and try to flesh out kind of, by looking at specific uses, try to flesh out what those areas might look like. Sounds good. All right. Great. Anything else? All right. That satisfies that element of the agenda. On the, of the agenda. Uh, before we adjourn, let me ask if there's any new business or comments. I wanted to, to make one point. Uh, I'm coming to the end of the community emergency response team program. Started in early March. And uh, for those who might be interested or know people who might be interested, I would say it's better than expected. It's somewhat time consuming, but you learn a lot. Uh, it's helpful not just for the community, but your own family. Uh, and they'll be doing it again in September in the North Shore area. There are other cities who are doing it at slightly different time periods too. Uh, but give it some thought or maybe suggest it to people you can, might be concerned about helping out in a case of a catastrophe. Um, so that's that. Uh, there being no new business, oh. I, yes, Lori. I, I just wanted to update you all on, on something that has been in front of me for the last several months, which has to do with wireless communication facilities. Uh, Remember all of the hard work we went to and, and uh, thought we came up with a great end product. Um, the wireless carriers have been very active in Olympia and are pushing uh, a bill that has come forward that would basically preempt local zoning uh, rules for small cells, small cells, it's focused to that. Um, likewise, the Federal Communications uh, Commission, FCC, is looking at national, some sort of national preemptions. So um, I've been very busy with the city lobbyist and then have also uh, the mayor sent a letter today to the FCC saying we worked through it, we spent 18 months doing it, local control is important here, please don't 
move to preempt this hard work we've done. And I will say that um, Association of Washington Cities, which represents obviously local jurisdictions, is very much opposed to the preemptions. Uh, but in a, one, the latest draft I've seen, they've tried to make it clear that cities that have adopted ordinances recently, us, and I think there's one other city, would not have to comply with these new, new oh. uh, rules. So we'll see where that all falls out. It's supposed to be determined this week. <laughs> Thank you for that update. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? <clears throat> all right. You guys are good? This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>